Hello and welcome to Conversations Queer Inuit Art, a collaboration between the Inuit Art Foundation and Smithsonian Arctic Cent Studies Center. My name is Alison Hardwick. I'm originally from Nunatsiavut and currently live in Toronto, where I work at the Inuit Art Foundation. Excuse the noise, streetcars going by on my street. <laughs> Um, although we are all joining remotely uh, from across North America today, I would like to acknowledge the land I currently reside on. I am on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, this place is home to many, including a diverse urban indigenous community of Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. Thanks so much for joining us today. This is the first in our collaborative conversation series, which will include six live webinars across 2021, bringing together Inuit across what is now Canada and Alaska for moderated discussions with audience participation, providing information and insights on subjects important to Indigenous communities. This series is a partnership between Inuit Art Foundation and Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center. On behalf of everyone at both organizations, I'd like to thank our advisors, Sonia Keller Combs, Casey Purik Kumigu, Hobson of the First Alaskans Institute, Krista Uliuk Zawatsky, and Taprilik Partridge of the Nordic Lab at Saw Gallery for their generous knowledge and guidance. Today's conversation will feature Jenny Irene Miller and Ozzy Michelin and is moderated by Alice Kanik Glenn. Alice Kanik Glenn is an Anupiak born and raised in Utkivik, Alaska. She hosts and produces her own podcast, Coffee and Quack, to celebrate and explore contemporary native life in urban Alaska. Jenny Irene Miller, who is also a Nupiak, is originally from Nome, Alaska, and is currently pursuing a master's of fine art photography at the University of New Mexico. Jenny employs photography, video, and sound in her art practice, which is grounded in storytelling, and her identity from indigeneity to queerness, as well as familial and community relations. Finally, Ozzy Michelin is an award-winning Inuk journalist, photographer, and filmmaker from the community of Northwest River in Nunatsiavut. He has worked as a journalist for over 10 years, reporting on indigenous news from coast to coast to coast. Ozzy works in a variety of media, including television news, radio, podcasts, and magazines, and online. This is just a small slice of our speaker's impressive CVs, and the conversation promises to be incredibly rich. I highly recommend visiting the event site through the links provided in the invitation for more information on each speaker and resources about this topic to learn more after the talk. And now I'm going to pass it off to Alice to begin the conversation. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alice Kaniglen. Thank you so much, Allison, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you so much to the Inuit Art Foundation for having me. Um, I would first and foremost like to acknowledge and recognize the Denina Athabaskan people um, on whose land I am currently on. It's summertime here. It's beautiful in Alaska right now. So as we're getting out to go out um, fishing, um, berry picking um, in the fall, I just like to um, recognize and acknowledge the uh, Denine Athabascan people because I live and um, reside and work in a beautiful place that I'm um, able to live healthily and to um, provide for my family um, berries, fish, everything um, in a healthy way. So past, past, present, and future Denine Ath Athabascan people. Um, I am from Utkervik, which is the northernmost city in the United States. Um, it's some uh, 700, 800 miles north of here uh, in Anchorage, Utkervik, um, Utkervik Mjogurunga. And um, like Allison said, I host and produce my own podcast, Savaktunga Kuper Lukwar Lumi. I work full time on my podcast titled Coffee and Kwak. So thank you so much for having us. And with that, I would like to introduce our wonderful, wonderful speakers, um, Jenny and Ozzy. And I would just like to ask that you both introduce yourselves. So, Jenny, can you please introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jenny Irene Miller. My Inupiaq name is Wiha Miu. I'm originally from Nome, Alaska, and I am Kingig Miu. My family originates from Kinigan, from Wales, Alaska, and we call ourselves Kingig Miu. 
I am thankful for all of you sharing your time with us today. I'm joining you all from Tiwa territory, which is also territory, which is also known as Albuquerque, New Mexico, where, um, as Allison mentioned, I'm a master of fine arts candidate at the University of New Mexico. And this fall, I'll be entering year three of the three-year program that I'm in. I want to thank the Inuit Art Foundation, the Inuit Advisors, and the Smithsonian Institution Arctic um, Study Center for making this space today to talk about queer Inuit art. And thank you for having me to share my perspective and some of my art. Asi, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Ozzy Michelin. I am a journalist and a filmmaker and a photographer. I'm Minok from Northwest River, Labrador. Um, uh, my father is a Labrador Inuk trapper. Uh, he also was a guide and worked in Labrador for most of his whole life. And my mom was is a nurse from Ontario who moved to Labrador to come work at the mission and she, in the 70s, and she's been there ever since. And here, here I am. Uh, so I grew up in Northwest River. It is my favorite place in the world. I am so very homesick right now because I'm talking to you all from Montreal, which is also I should acknowledge them on the traditional lands of the Ganyakahaga people and of the Algonquin Nation as well. And that um, I'm very pleased to be on their lands and I love this city, but I just want to go home and I want to eat some salmon this summer. So hopefully the, the vaccine will allow this to happen. I've got my shot and let's see. Hopefully all goes well. Um, a little bit about what I do, I guess. Uh, I, I, I just made my first documentary film called Evan's Drum, which is about the return of Inuit drum dancing to Labrador, just kind of talking about uh, how that it's returned and now it's being passed on to the next generation. And I have a podcast series coming out on CBC Radio about uh, 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 decolonizing different words. Uh, it's going to be out um, starting on Monday. So if you all want to check that out, it's called Telling Our Twisted Histories. And um, I, I'd also like to thank uh, the folks for organizing this. I'm so excited for this talk. I think there needs to be more out there talking about queer Inuit art, and I'm just so happy to be part of this. So I first want to start with, um, can you tell us a little bit about your artwork and how your queer Inuit identity influences your artistic practice? Can we start with Jenny? I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to cruise so through some, some work. Um, can you all see this uh, document, this photograph? Yes. All right. So thank you. Um, so, and Allison kind of mentioned the intro, but um, I currently work with photography, video, and sound, and I have been exploring the mediums of sculpture and textiles, and I'm finding strength in my practice and the possibilities of working with other tools and materials outside of the photograph. Many of my photographs begin with, a, I mean, many of my projects begin with a photograph and when the image cannot deliver what I need it to, I move on to other materials and tools. Portraiture is important to my practice. I've been thinking about the genre of portraiture and challenging what can be considered a portrait through the different mediums I work with. And here in the slideshow, I'll be showing some like in progress work and um, work that I have shown before and work that you can see on my website as well. Um, I consider how the land can serve as a portrait of identity, how photographic portraits of loved ones can speak to my relations with them, sharing information about myself, providing the viewer with clues about what I deem important. How can I make tangible the memories and stories of kin? My creative practice is informed by research. I continue to expand upon an interdisciplinary approach that includes my familial and communal oral histories and archives. Importantly, my research methods are derived from conversations with my relatives, elders, and community members. I find sources and jumping off points for my art and written works by indigenous scholars, writers, and poets. Some are queer and some are not, yet recognize the importance of queer indigenous voices. In my work, I critically examine US policies that impact my community and other indigenous peoples, as well as queer folks in the settler project of the United States. So with this, I'm working to engage interdisciplinary research and knowledge into works that reimagine a colonial past. And in doing so, I center a contemporary presence 
that defines the many possibilities of indigenous futurity. It is a future that is centered in kinship, relations and place, land, intimacy, queer love, humor, protection, refusal and home. And additionally, I've been thinking a lot about queerness in relation to my work and my art practice. What does queerness look like and what does intimacy look like? For me, they do not show up in one way and are neither static nor bound. Queer love is full life, it is tender, it is caring, and it is important. It is about closeness and touch and small and beautiful details. So while thinking about home, and I know Ozzy mentioned how you were missing home a lot, I've been missing home quite a bit, um, being here in New Mexico in a totally different land than up north. Um, I've been thinking about home and began to make new photographs that are focused on where I, where I make home and where I find love. So this work also features where I find comfort. It is a site where quiet moments are celebrated and speak to intimacy. This is ongoing, this work is in progress and ongoing. Um, and I guess to wrap up kind of like what my work is about and what influences my art practice or I guess the general reason why um, I'm draw so drawn to photography is it allows me to spend more time with a particular subject theme or emotion within the parameters that I set up. Photography provides a space for me to practice a form of careful observation that runs deep in the Inupiaq culture that I come from. Um, and I'll stop sharing and pass the mic off. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm not, uh, a tr I don't know, I don't always consider myself a traditional artist. I am a filmmaker. I do make, I do do photography, but I consider myself a journalist and a storyteller first. Um, telling stories, crafting narratives, getting messages out. It's just always been what I've been passionate about. And whether I get to do that through photography, through film, through stories, I really just want to get it out there. And I think everything that I do, um, my, I guess this is my openness coming through, is that Everything I do, I do it for two reasons. I do it for so that we will see ourselves reflected in the conversations that are going on, whether it is in a podcast or in an arts magazine, or if it's uh, in a conversation like this. And I also do it as well. So um, I try to sort of explain the indigenous world, the Inuit world, the North as best I can so that other people don't have to do all that work because we get tired of going through the 101s all the time. So um, a lot of the work I do that is kind of focuses on those two things. But then I also think about like my culture and how important it is to sort of, you know, everything is relationship based and relationship forward. And I really want to try, when I do these stories, no matter who it is, people come first. The humanity of the story always comes first. How it affects people, what they're doing, what their lives are, why it's important. Because if there's not a people involved, it's not a story. And I wanna make sure as well, when I'm writing about these things or you know, showing people in photography or showing people in videos that they're happy with how they're being represented because there's so many times that we all know this that people come in and they take our stories and they leave and we just got to cross our fingers and hope the stories are right. So I think it's really, really important for all Indigenous people, for all Inuit to tell our own stories and we tell our own stories in so many different ways, whether it's through voice, whether it's through song, whether it's through painting, photography, video, this is all just an extension of us telling our stories. Now, how does my queerness influence what I do? This, this one's two parts. And um, the first part, no pictures. Second part, we'll have pictures. And the first part is um, I am a, I always write for, root for the underdog, no matter what. Just That's just who I am. I know what it's like. And I think a lot of us queers do. And because of this, you know, when I see a story about an underdog, when I see somebody who is up and coming and they're really wanting to get their voice out there and make the world see their art, I'm going to try to help them as best I can because that's just who I am. Now, the second part, I will share my screen. So um, this is about my photography. And um, this is sort of a, a little bit about where my where my queer inokness comes in, I guess. And this is this is the view from my backyard in Northwest River. This is like um, like a few feet from my mom's deck, and we get sunsets like this like every year around the solstice. It's just beautiful, and it's my favorite place to be. And a lot of the stories I tell and things that I share um, involve around Indigenous land defenders and people fighting to protect their lands and their homes. And I realized one day that's not enough. We need to show what people are fighting for. So I made it my mission since then as well to include in my photography 
And also just because this is beautiful and it's my home and I love it, I want to show what's so special about wh what it is that we're all fighting for. So this is one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. Um, this is what, some of, as I speak about some of the things that we are fighting against, this is Muscat Falls hydroelectric project, which was built on my family's traditional land a few kilometers up from where we all hunt and fish. And, but through my photography and the work I've done, I've been able to help people hear about this and help my community get heard about all these things. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I love the work that I do. Um, this is probably the most famous picture I've ever taken. Uh, it's won all kinds of awards. Uh, it's been interpreted into painting, into prints. Someone's carving it at a stone right now, um, all kinds of stuff. And I was really, really thinking on, like, you know, being a queer, you know, artist, photographer, and what does it mean? And I thought back to this picture. This is Amanda Polches from Elsie Booktook, by the way. Amanda's my sister from another mister. I'm her brother from another mother, we call each other. Um, and this picture, yeah, went around the world. And I and what I was thinking about is that my my work, oh, and I'll show you the next one before I get explain it. Uh, this is taken exactly three years later and three years and three days. And this is at the protest against the big dam I showed earlier against the Muscat Falls hydroelectric project. And that's 13 year old Allison Gear. Uh, her family's from Postville, Nazivut, and she's growing up in Happy Valley. No, she was, she's in Postville again now. And here she is drum dancing in front of a busload of construction workers going to build the dam. Uh, this one also won a bunch of awards and it's up at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And anyways, but I was thinking about it, like why do my pictures really focus on strong indigenous women? And I think it's really because growing up in, indigenous women were, they were my protectors. They were the people that watched out for me. They were the ones that told the bullies to like screw off. They were the ones to tell the kids from the, the group of kids from the other town that were going to run over and beat me up, like go away, leave them alone, you know? And I think that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Indigenous women. And that my work just kind of focuses on that in a lot of ways because it's what I feel comfortable about. It's it's what I know. And it's the side of Indigenous women and Indigenous women that I want the whole world to see because this is what I see. And I want everyone to see that. So yeah, that's 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 my uh, that's my response. I'll uh, pass it on back to you, Alice. Thank you. Oh my goodness, it was so awesome to see. Um, I, I've seen a little bit of, of Jenny's work uh, in the past before because Jenny and I know one another. But it was so awesome to see your work too, Ozzy. Thank you so much um, for sharing. And uh, it, it's just it's so cool to to see what you guys have worked on and what um, inspires you. What are some unique challenges or, um, or opportunities? So I wanted to leave it open between challenges or opportunities um, with the intersectionality of being Inuk and queer. Can we start with Jenny? Yeah, thanks for that question, Alice. So I, I used to see a lot of the challenges, especially thinking about how, how some colonial spaces that Inuit have entered, mostly through a simulation, and continue to adapt and transform those spaces. I saw those spaces as not welcoming to me as a queer and a black person. Um, however, since coming out, um, those who matter most to me, my family, the community where I'm from and the elders from both Wales, Alaska, where my maternal family roots originate and Nome continue to welcome me, welcome me in and support me. And they see me as my whole self, which I think is really important. So now I mostly see the opportunities. You see, I've got a lot of privilege being who I am, being light-skinned as a mixed in the back person. I'm a first-generation college student and the first of my immediate family to, end, to attend graduate school. I see a lot of opportunity for me to find ways to give back to the communities who have built me up the Inuit and the queer communities. So every time I get the chance to share my story when space is provided, um, that makes me pretty happy um, because that means uh, hopefully that will make space for other indigenous queer peoples to take up that space and be who they are and to inspire dialogue on how to make our communities safe and welcoming for queer peoples. Um, I also think that mentorship is important I'm, uh, I would classify myself as an emerging artist. Um, I've been working in arts for a while, but um, I've been able to dedicate more time to my art practice full time lately, which I also think is a huge privilege. Um, so mentorship is important. 
I want to give back through mentorship to uplift other indigenous queer artists and especially our queer youth. I feel it's important to, um, to provide that space as well and that mentorship. So yeah, I think I, I mostly look at the opportunities. How can I make space for others? And um, what is my work doing um, to bring forward conversations that inspire dialogue and how to make our community safer for indigenous queer folks? Thank you, Jenny. Ozzy? I always just think about this. This happens from time to time where I just get some random person in a quiet moment that just says, Ozzy, I, I have a question to ask you. And they always, and I'm like, oh, here we go. It mustn't have been easy growing up gay in Labrador, was it? And I have to do the, well, actually, it was probably just as easy growing up gay in Labrador as it was growing, else, growing up anywhere else in the country in the 1990s. Yes, there were shitty people, but you know what? People don't really care because I'm from this town and people love me because I'm from the town and I'm related to everyone. And I think that that always surprise people. But there is a certain like ring of truth to this. And I have been actually thinking about, about being queer and Inuk. And I think that a lot of queer folks, we've experienced at some point in our lives being the outsider, being the weirdo, being excluded from the group. I know everybody has to a certain degree, but queer folk, it's part of the, 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 the role. We're just sort of, we're always a bit different. That's part of what makes us so great, honestly. <laughs> But when you're younger and you're still trying to define yourself and defend yourself and explain yourself, you know, that's when it's hard. So I think that being queer in Inuk, it sort of shows you this double edged sword of community. You know, it shows you the good of the community, which is you're part of this place, you're accepted, your roots run deep, your family's there, everybody has known each other for generations. But then also, you're the weird one. <laughs> so you know what it's like to not fit in the box to be sort of like, um, you know, sometimes people don't know what to make of you. Sometimes like there's people that don't like you because of this. And it kind of makes you have this sort of really deep empathy, I think, that I've met in almost every queer Indigenous person or a lot of just queer folks from small towns. Some folks, they get, once you get past the, the hurt and anger, and that's, there's a lot of that there, don't get me wrong, but there's so many strong, beautiful, queer Inuit that I know that are making great art and raising families and contributing to the communities. And I really, really think that in my lifetime alone, things have changed so much, like so much and people become so much more accepting. And I think about like, I brought my husband home to live with me in my town for two years and they love him. They, 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 they're bored with me when I come home to visit. They're like, where's Hugo? But why isn't he here? What, when is he coming next? Why is he not here with you? And I'm like, I'm here with work, guys. I love you too. <laughs> so I think that things are really, they're really changing for the best. And I, and I completely agree with what Jenny said, is just that we're part of this change that's happening right now. And we have a responsibility to show like all these young queer indigenous youth coming up that we can be part of the community and still be queer and weird and we can be an artist and we can do whatever we want without sacrificing part of who we are because we're many things all at once and most of the times you've known us or you've known our families forever so you know that we're not just like <laughs> we're, why would we be making this up to you you know like this is who we are and I think that our communities are now becoming much so much more richer you know so much more beautiful that we're accepting who we are and the full range of who we are and there's a lot of colonial vegas to shake off there's a long ways to go yet but you know we're getting there we're making progress and i feel that the next generations to come will have an easier time being queer and you know than any generation before thank you okay so i need to talk about the word queer because in preparation for this, uh, for this discussion, I was um, kind of, you know, putting some feelers out to my aunties and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to host this discussion um, on queer Inuit art. And they're like, what? You can't say that. Like, that's not appropriate, you know? So can we, can we talk a little bit about the word queer and, and whether or not it's appropriate or, or why or why it isn't appropriate? What do you guys, what do you guys think about um, the word queer? I'll, I'll take this one to start if you don't mind um well <laughs> it's it's kind of cheeky it's a word that we got to reclaim it's a little bit subversive and I think it's really inclusive because it just means different 
And you don't need to necessarily specify how it means different. And you don't have to fit yourself into the gay box or the lesbian box or the bisexual box. You can just be queer and it's whatever it means to you. And that's what I love about being queer in Inuk because there's no one way to be queer. There's no one way to be Inuk, you know? <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just this beautiful diversity of people. So that's, that's my thoughts. Yeah, I, I love that you hit on that, that we're reclaiming the word queer and um, it's different meanings to each person. I think what's important, so uh, before I left for graduate school, I um, volunteered a lot with um, queer youth back home in Alaska. And I learned a lot from um, the LGBTQ plus queer, uh, queer youth. And um, we, it's really, it depends on also how the person defines themselves. So I'm, I, I um, identify as being queer. I also identify as being indigenous queer. Um, and so I think it's really important to first ask the person, how do you identify? Um, and then be able to navigate that path. Um, but also queerness is, there's something so special about it. And also thinking about queer has become more of an umbrella term as well. So thinking about the queer community, instead of using LGBTQ2+, um, all of that um, important identities within that acronym. Um, but queer has, became, is, has become reclaimed. And I think there's a lot of power in that, um, in that word. And talking about, uh, you know, you connecting with your aunties, Alice, I have over the years that I've, um, since I've come out, I've been trying to, I've been, I, I focus a lot of my energy on trying to find a term, a, a back term that could um, define me or associate me as being in the back and queer. Um, and I was really focused on, were there any words used in the past? Um, but over the years I've become aware or have acknowledged that um, as Inuit people, we're constantly adapting and um, integrating new technologies, new terminology into our lives. So um, I've been talking with some mentors of mine over the years, and we've been talking about well, what if in our different dialects, we worked with the elders to create a term for Inupak queer people, Inuit queer people that works for us. So it's a term bias for us um, because we there's been words that have been um, new words in, uh, in our languages and dialects that have been created recently. Um, so I think there's a lot of power in, in the now and um, working together as a community and hopefully uh, we can come together and create some of our own terminology. Thank you um, for sharing a little bit about the word queer and because um, I don't, <laughs> necessarily feel comfortable unless, you know, you guys tell me that it's okay. But, uh, so I know that I I've been interviewed a couple of times, um, about art. And, uh, I know that there was some guy here in Anchorage that was recreating native art and, um, selling it as his own. So like this idea of appropriation and, um, and he just got a slap on the wrist basically as, um, as a, you know, like kind of like an imposter. He was selling native art and he's not a native person. Um, and if you think about anywhere else in the world, like if somebody was doing that, it's almost like they didn't recognize um, native art as a real um, form or acceptable art. Um, otherwise the, the punishment would be more severe in some cases is, you know, my thought process. So, you know, I think that there's this level of um, distinguished or revered art, you know, things that you see like in a museum or, um, you know, things that you buy that are uh, highly valued, I guess you could say in, a, in maybe a, in a Western system or in a Western lens. Um, and then this idea of like crafts, like these are just things that people make. Um, and then, uh, there's some, I guess you could say like, there's the, this relationship also with like, um, sometimes if we're not living in our villages or in our communities, it, it, it's like this level of, um, am I Inuk enough? Am I native enough? Um, 
So, I mean, how do you, how do you guys approach this idea of like acceptable art and then acceptable in Um, so can we start with Ozzy? Yeah, I've been thinking on this one and I just think I, I've been surrounded by so many brilliant uh, craftspeople my whole life. And many, many of them have like pieces of their work in museums and galleries, but they also have them in their living rooms. And I also, I wonder like the, the carving that, the, that somebody gave to his mother for her birthday versus the carving that he sold to the museum why is one more special than another? Is it means that the further that these pieces get away from the community, the more value they have or the other way around? You know, like I just I just don't understand this this process. I think that, you know, we always knew that these were talented artists in our towns. And so many people in my community have like pieces of work from artists that are like, like I said, in museums and galleries all over the place because they're just in the towns and there's so many raffles and auctions and church fundraisers and things that happen that like this, they just end up scattered all over town. It's just sort of how it happens. So I think that this idea of drawing a line around saying these, these are separate from these and these are worth more than these and these are more valuable or more important than this or like, or it's just, it doesn't make sense to me. And I think that we need to break down these sort of um, distinctions and just recognize that we have all this great talented art coming from this wealth of knowledge that is not located in an institution. It's located in our homes where it has always been. Um, yeah, so that's what I think about that. And then sort of, I've also been sort of thinking about like, what's an acceptable level of inukness and queerness as well. And I think that like, I don't know, I'm half Inuk, but I don't say that because I'm all of me. I was raised with my, my family in Labrador. I know my culture, I know my family, I know my community, I know I'm accepted. I, that, that's, that's all that I need. And we have this expression back home and I love it. And we say to people, who owns you? And that's just meaning who's your family? Who claims you? And I think that when it comes to, you know, questioning someone's identity, it comes down to who is claiming them, not who they're claiming to be. If you have a community or you have a family or a culture, and I don't just mean like, you know, one of our communities, I mean, like it could be an urban community. It could be whatever, you know what I mean? As long as you have the people who are claiming you as, as being one of them, that's the most important thing. And it doesn't matter what a piece of paper or a card or whatever says, if you have a family, if you have a community and they say who you are, then who, who knows better, some stranger or these dozens of people that have known you your whole life. So that's, that's my thoughts. This is, this is a question that I've been thinking about a lot within my practice and uh, within the art world in general. And I think, and again, these are, I wanna just clarify that these are my opinions as being one in back person. I don't speak for all new back people. Um, but I think the mainstream art world is still catching up to what indigenous and Inuit art is and how it doesn't fit perfectly into the Western art canon and how the Western art canon art terminology doesn't always work for indigenous art. Um, there's so much misunderstanding, uh, gatekeeping. So thinking about non-native curator, curators deciding what is traditional and what is contemporary and setting up this binary that at times can be dangerous and deciding what is indigenous art and what is deemed worthy of being exhibited, sold and written about by non-indigenous folks who don't even understand indigenous sovereignty and the impacts of colonialism past and ongoing. Or that we as Inuit are contemporary and don't fit into stereotypes that attempt to trap us in the past. Uh, we do have some great allies who are doing the hard work too, so I don't wanna dismiss them. I also believe that there's a lack of understanding that each indigenous, each Inuk artist belongs to a unique community. So it's important to look at view indigenous art with the understanding that each indigenous artist comes from a unique tradition, art and worldview depending on place. I've learned a lot of this from Jolene Rickard scholarship who I think is making important interventions in indigenous art practice and theory. And I want to be, yeah, um, 
So Jolene Rickard's scholarship I've been reading a lot of, and I just wanted to give a shout out to um, her because I think her work is important. And to go back to this binary of craft versus fine art, there are, like Ozzy was saying, there are incredible Inuit curators and Inuit artists making work that is grounded in Inuit worldviews. Uh, I know some of them are in the audience, um, but take, for example, the All Inuit Group Exhibition Inua, which opened at the Winnipeg Art Gallery late in late March. That show was curated by a group of Inuit and spans across many mediums, from carvings to installations. I haven't seen the show uh, in person, but the opening video and the documentation photographs of the exhibition are powerful. That show to me redefines and breaks down the stereotypes of what Inuit art is and what it can be. Inuit in, are in charge of that narrative. So we need more Inuit uh, curators and critics to be uplifted and recognized in our art sp spaces and our elders and community members have important contributions to Inuit art as well. And our allies, and I think that our allies need to understand the complexities of indigenous art and indigenous issues of sovereignty. And I could, I'll go on because this question, I've been, again, I've been thinking a lot about this in my art practice. So thinking about many non-indigenous people can't even name whose land they reside on or can't even name a contemporary influential in indigenous person. So how are they supposed to understand the complexities of Inuit and indigenous art in general, if they don't have that basic, basic knowledge? And I'll quote Jolene Rickard again, or quote her for the first time, but mention her again. It is prudent to discuss tradition, art and sovereignty based on a specific cultural location while reserving the right to connect these ideas to a to broader discussion of aesthetic practice as a colonial intervention. So for me, I think it's important to think about the unseen histories and also what's happening be beyond the frame or, or object when viewing art. And I've come to the conclusion that my work has different audiences and depending on their cultural knowledge and some parts of my work may be seen or understood differently by people. And I'm okay with that. So if my work is specific to indigenous communities, to Inupak communities, some of the work is going to be read significantly different than those who are not from those communities. Well, thinking about acceptable Inuit art, hmm, um, I think about what messages my work is sharing. Is it working against stereotypes or is it perpetuating harm? Does it share indigenous joy, humor, love, the challenges, or is it continuing to hurt the communities my work features or even myself as a queer in the back? My, my work is not acceptable if it hurts the people I feature, if it caters to the narrow uh, ver version of what Inuit queer art can be. And if I'm not challenging myself, if I'm not continuing to learn and grow, and I'm not asking myself hard questions about my work and not acknowledging when I make a mistake, then I need to readdress my practice. And for me as an Inupak artist, and especially during the times when my work involves working with the Inupak community I belong to, or indigenous communities in general, and the queer community, and even Inuit stories that are accessible to peoples outside of our communities, those relations to people and the source materials have to be grounded in respect. I learned so much from the people I make photographs of, the indigenous theory, scholarship and poetry that I'm reading, which inspires my work, as well as other indigenous artists. I often think about what can be shared and what shouldn't be shared with non-Inuit viewers. And I always think about how I would want to be portrayed is work respectful towards my people and the participants who are sharing their story with me and allowing me to share it through the mediums I work with. I think those are important questions that I always ask myself within my art practice. And I could go on critiquing the institutions, but I think we've got some, some really great allies in the institutions and I wanted to give a shout out to the Inua show. Cool.
<clears throat> um, Jenny and I did a, a fellowship together a couple of years ago and my favorite um, time in the fellowship was just hanging out with Jenny and having these conversations and just picking each other's brains. So it's so good to hear you um, speak. So thank you, Jenny. Uh, and, and while you were speaking and while Ozzy was speaking, it kind of occurred to me, I, I wanna know what inspires both of you to create. Um, I think that you guys speak with a lot of passion, but I, can you share a little bit about what inspires you um, to create? Can we start with Ozzy? Yeah, I kind of touched on it earlier where I just want to create things that Inuit and other Indigenous people can look at and see themselves reflected back in and feel that they're part of the conversation. Um, I really try to show us as complex modern people with lives. <laughs> we can still, you know, you can still uh, be an Indigenous person. You can still be, you could be a traditional person. You could uh, be an urban person and not care about your traditions at all. You can do all these things, but we're just such as big, complex human beings like anybody else that's out there. And I think that a lot of times we get kind of flattened and, you know, you might be able to be like, okay, you can be Inuk, but you can be Inuk and maybe a slight variation. But that's it. That's it. Here are the acceptable variations. And I think that the work that I do is really trying to highlight just, yeah, us as people, us just being different and doing our own things and highlighting what we care about. Um, and sometimes that is, does involve our culture, our land, our traditions, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's a mixture of things. And usually it's that. Usually it's a mixture of things. And I think those are the most powerful stories. And I also really try to think, too, as well, with the work I do, I try to develop a relationship with the people. And that's really important to me is that, you know, they feel comfortable in what they're sharing with me, with their, you know, whether they're sharing their artwork or they're sharing a story about their lives, that it just comes across you know, I want them to be happy and I want them to feel comfortable because it comes across in the work that we do. And if we do this together collaboratively, then it's going to be even better and it's really going to shine. And that's what I really want to do is work with my community to help share our stories. For me, my my inspiration comes from from my relations, from kinship, from home, from place, and also being surrounded by artists throughout my life. Um, and having mentorships from uh, particular artists as well. I first became fascinated by the photograph at a very young age. Uh, my, my family has this really amazing um, archive of family photographs from the generations. So through those photographs, I get to see um, snippets of what my great grandparents' lives were like, my um, grandparents, and then how um, my mom's life uh, shifted a bit when she had my brother and I and continually look at those photographs as maybe like portals um, that can transport me over time and space and can connect me through um, generations of the past and now and then maybe future kin can uh, look at those photographs as well. So I would say as an, an Inupak person, art has always been around within the communities. We have amazing skin sewers within our communities, um, ivory carvers, um, painters, filmmakers. I could go on, so many talented people. So just being inspired by them and kinship, I think is the number one, um, is number one for me. Cool. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing to that as well. I, I forgot to mention one thing. One of the things that inspires me and I think is that um, for most of my life, we've had people coming in and getting, bringing our stories out, like exporting our stories. And once it leaves, we just have to cross our fingers that we have a good relationship with the person telling the stories that they're going to get it right. I think that there's so much room uh, and it's so important that we have Indigenous people and Inuit telling our own stories uh through whatever medium that they choose to tell their stories through because this has not been this is it's not new for us because we've always been telling these stories but getting these stories out there to the rest of the world so they can see us as like fully rounded modern human beings i think is really important and that's one of the things that inspires me and i've been inspired by so many other great artists of different kinds and people you know what we've had some good filmmakers and good journalists and good researchers come in and they have done so much to help us and inspire us and give us what we need, but there's also been the bad ones. So both the good and the bad inspire me to make sure that our stories get out there and that we're telling our own stories. And every chance that I get, I, I wanna try to help 
young Indigenous folks who are interested in doing the same thing to help them do it because we need this to keep on going forever. So yeah, that, that's the other thing that really inspires me that I, I just blanked on. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, so let's talk about stereotypes. Um, I feel like it's always an upward um, uphill battle, right? Against uh, being Inuit and combating these stereotypes and, you know, throw being queer into that mix. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a lot. So what, what would you say is the, the biggest misconception or stereotype about queer Inuit? And how do you challenge or break down um, stereotypes? I think the biggest stereotype is that we don't exist. <laughs> I think it's that people see being queer as sort of a, this is I, as this, as a stereotyping it as a modern thing and that being Inuit is something from the past. So there's no way these two stereotypes can interact. And how do we break this down? Just, and, and, I, and it's gonna come off as kind of a joke, but it's serious. We, we break down these stereotypes by continuing to be awesome. And I really, really mean that. We continue telling stories, we continue raising families, we continue contributing to our communities, we continue making art, we continue just being ourselves and getting out there and the more that we get out there and we tell our own stories, I mean, the more that we get out there and we share our own perspectives, the more that these stereotypes will break and people will realize that, hey, maybe that our concept of queerness and maybe our concept of inokness actually do fit together. And maybe that these stereotypes, that this is not real. So I think that we just need more folks like Jenny doing what, what, what they do and getting their art out there. And we need more folks telling stories. We need just, like I said, we just need more of us. If you can clone us, do it, you know, like, or if you can't clone us, then at least do what we can to help that next young generation of queers coming up in our community, because we want them to shine brighter than we, even we are. Thanks, Ozzy. Jenny? Hmm. What's the biggest misconception about queer Inuit? Ah, well, a misconception that I used to think when I was younger, was that, um, or more before I came out, was that my brother and I were the only uh, queer in the back people. Uh, but there's so many queer uh, Inuit folks out there and it makes me so happy to be able to connect with others and learn more about um, what they're doing in their communities and um, outside of their communities. But to answer your question, I'm going to focus on the arts um, because I think in, in my opinion, Inuit art has been put into boxes that have been defined by those outside of our communities. And it is up to Inuit artists who are creating art, who are helping to define what Inuit art is, what it has been and what it can be. I like to think that Inuit art is, is not static just as our cultures aren't. For example, as an Inupiaq artist, I work far differently than my late great grandma who was a talented skin sewer. And really I would consider her an artist. Although I don't think she called herself an artist. Um, she worked with furs, textiles and created patterns that detailed the fancy fur parkas she made which contained powerful and important signals about the wear of the garment and where they came from. Today, I work with what is available to me. I work with the camera with my hands and continue to explore tools that are new to me to express myself through my art. And this ties into um, a new back art making. Our ancestors were constantly integrating new technologies and methods into their daily routines. They were constantly adapting and creating a world that worked for them, which allowed for me to be here today. I like to think that Inuit art and Inuit queer art is similar. Inuit art often serves as a worldview into Inuit realities, histories, stories, and issues. So why wouldn't our art reflect what is happening today as well? Inuit art is how we impart knowledge, share information, and tell stories. And I'm grateful for Inuit artists who have, become, who have come before me, who have inspired me and helped me realize that a future in the arts is possible. Inuit artists who have come before me really paved the way for younger and emerging artists like me. And we have that strong foundation. So 
I think some of the misconceptions come from outside of our communities and um, Inuit queer art. I mean, as a Inuit, as a Inupiaq queer person creating art, my art is, I would say automatically queer Inuit art. And it also often features queer stories, realities, um, and integrate some of our um, in the back world views as well. Thanks for sharing. Um, so as an in back podcaster, me, myself, um, I oftentimes feel a lot of weight um, in, in the stories that I tell and um, in what I choose to cover. It feels um, sometimes it can be like heavy, you know, because I'm not just representing myself I'm also representing Inupiaq, um, you know, ideas, thoughts, people. Sometimes I feel that way. I, it feels like a lot of weight. Um, so we're so community oriented, you know, as, as Inuit. Um, as an indigenous creator, do you ever feel the need to carry the weight of representing your community? Do you ever feel that weight? I could answer that quickly. I often feel like I have this really um, large responsibility at times if I'm integrating Inupiaq stories into my work or even uh, indigenous peoples into my work. So automatically I feel like I have this re responsibility but I also need to remind viewers and different folks who I'm talking to that I am just one a new back person and I don't speak for everyone, but this is how I'm sharing these stories. This is, um, this is a, a portal into my worldview, into my realities, and also the folks who allow me to share their stories. So it comes with this sense of responsibility. So again, coming um, respect plays a lot of a, a large role in my work, um, thinking about how I work with different peoples, thinking about, like I said earlier, is this how I would want to be represented? But at the end of the day, I have to, I have to remind myself that um, that's a huge responsibility to take on by one person. And so I often leave it at that is I can do my best and just remember to remain respectful, aware and um, create work that I am, uh, proud of. Thanks, Jenny. Ozzy? Um, yeah, I would say, well, first of all, I say that I can't represent anybody other than myself. Um, I, I can't represent queer Inuit. I can't represent Labrador. I can only represent me. And I don't think anybody else can say that they represent queer Inuit as a whole. Like, we're just so varied and so different. Um, I feel the responsibility that Jenny is talking about is, is part of it is responsibility. Sometimes it's heavy. Sometimes it's rocket fuel. You know, sometimes that's what drives me to do what I'm doing is to make sure that my community is recognized or we have a voice of some kind or we're have, you know, that the story is getting told right or at least getting told in a way that the community is comfortable with it. And I think that sometimes it's, it's a case by case basis. I don't think I can say that, you know, like you can't represent everybody all the time. And it's a thing that you can try to help. You can try, I, I can try to help people understand where I'm from. I can help people try to understand my community. I can't represent anybody but myself, but I can help them try to better understand from my knowledge and my experiences and from the people that I, I uh, represent in my work, whether it's journalism or photography, I try to help provide a more accurate picture so that when someone talks to somebody else in my community, they have a better idea, a better starting point I guess, so that they have something to talk on and try to help like break down some of these stereotypes. So yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a duty, it's a responsibility, it's a role to serve, um, but I don't represent anyone but me. And I, think, and I think that if you talk to most Inuit, they'll say that, they'll say that I can only represent myself, but I can try to help you better understand. Thank you. That was kind of a selfish question for me because I, I oftentimes struggle with that because, you know, I it's hard. It can be really hard sometimes. And, uh, you know, sometimes people expect so much from you, you know, and, and you try your best, but like you can't always be everything to everyone. Right. And so um, 
for me, I, I appreciate both of your, your input on that. Um, okay. Moving on to our next question. As, as we know, storytelling is, uh, is a cornerstone in, uh, Inuit communication, you know, uh, much of our knowledge, our, um, everything, right. Everything was passed down generation to generation through storytelling. Um, and many of our languages weren't written. So, um, it had to be up here. Right. And so I think that, um, that's a big part and a big part of our, our identity as Inuit. <clears throat> Um, how do you, how do you use art as a storytelling device, um, within your communities? Can we start with Jenny? This is, yeah, this is another question that I've been thinking a lot about within my practice, because I do consider my work to be grounded in storytelling. And I think that it's just another way of sharing our story. So, um, like I mentioned, my main medium is photography, but I also work in um, video and sound and have been exploring sculpture and textiles here in grad school. Um, but I see that my art is, is very much grounded in storytelling. Um, and I'm a Nupak, and just as my Nupak ancestors' identities were formed, my identity is shaped by um, where I come from. And who I am is formed by my relations to kin, to the land, to the ocean, my family, the community I come from and those who I love. And my identity is found within stories remembered and told by my family and elders and the stories I'm forming today with my art practice. And with this, thinking about storytelling, thinking about photography or the different projects that I've worked on um, hopefully those, those pieces can be, um, they can be looked at by other uh, Indigenous or Inupak Inuit folks um, for them to find story and find connections. But really my work acknowledges the communities I come from and the unseen histories and stories. And with this, I've also been thinking about the power I hold as an artist, especially when photo-based works are created. And how much information I choose to provide to the viewer and how much I uh, keep for myself. And I'm thinking about how the refusal of information can, when I feel is necessary, protect the person or non-human kin being photographed or visualized. Um, when employed, I think this strategy can enact a form of attention. It requires a close read of the work. And ultimately it's it talks of, it's about who has access to this information. And I think this also ties into um, our, oral, our oral stories and storytelling. Not all of our stories are um, made for the general public. Some of those stories are kept within our communities, within our families. So I just see my work as another form of storytelling, of sharing our histories and our identities um, with paying close attention to um, what is mine to share and what is not mine to share. So knowing that not all of these stories belong to me, but maybe I'm just, my work can sometimes serve as a um, device to share that. Thanks, Jenny. Ozzy? Well, um, as, as someone who works as a journalist and a filmmaker and an editor, uh, what I do by default is storytelling, but I come from a long, long, long line of storytellers. I have a very large family and I just grew up hearing stories all around the kitchen table of stories of, you know, being out on the land, tall tales, stories about just, you know, gossip and drama, but always just some sort of story, sometimes of just of different kinds. And I think that hearing these stories being told and recited to me just by everybody has really kind of shaped sort of my voice when it comes to writing and filmmaking and sharing, and that it's really sort of based in yeah, based in that. And I think that the stories I tell, I want to try to tell stories that are that are important to my community, that they want to see told, that are that are important. Because I think that if it's not important for the people in the stories, if it's not important for my community uh, or another community out there, I don't, it doesn't fire me up to go and, and do these things. Um, I think that uh, I, I just want to share a still again one more time really quickly. I forgot to do this one before, but this is from uh, Evan's drum and that's Evan right there. Uh, and it's the story about a 
that's something that's really important happening in my community right now, which is about in the early uh, 2000s, drum dancing came back to Labrador. We, it went away for generations and it came back. And now the people who learned to drum dance as like teenagers are now adults and they have kids. And this is Evan right here. And his mom is one of the drum dancers uh, in Happy Valley Goose Bay, the next town over for me. And this is something that's really important that's happening in my community. And it's just so amazing to see the, the, the kids picking it up and, and playing the drums. And it's something that just brings so much pride to people in my community that when I had a chance to like try to get to tell the story, I knew like I need to show do this right. I need to make this the most Labrador film ever. I need everyone to get excited by this because it deserves to be you know, people deserve to get excited about this wave of of uh, cultural revitalization that's coming through Labrador. And this is just like, I get to, but like I said before, I really try to show the humans, the, the people involved. I don't want to show this is a big tradition and traditions are coming back because traditions are good. I just want to show here's a family. And in this family, the tradition is coming back and this is how it impacts them. And I think that part of telling stories about Indigenous communities and Inuit communities specifically is that you focus things on the family and on the home and on the individuals there. And you can see how big issues that people are talking about, um, how they get, how they actually affect real people. And it helps to, to, you know, people to better understand what's going on to humanize some of these issues and not just have it as sort of like an abstract idea. So I want to tell stories that my community is proud of and I want to tell stories that will help people better under to better understand us. Alice, if, yeah, please. If I could kind of, Ozzy reminded me of something, and I think a lot of my stories that are involved in my work are about representation as well. So seeing queer indigenous folks, seeing their um, portraits and their stories, I think is really meaningful. So thinking about when I was coming out, I was thinking about who are some like um, people, some potential indigenous queer mentors that I could reach out to. And um, I knew of a, of a few, mostly my, my older brother, who's four years older than me and some other um, great friends from Nome. But I was really looking, searching for um, someone, you know, much older, but I couldn't really, I didn't really know who that person was. So um, that's kind of what inspired me to create some of my earlier work um, is thinking about how can we make these, um, these folks, these stories visible and how do we, how can I um, take up space? So thinking about taking up space in a, in a gallery, um, thinking about queer indigenous portraits being in a gallery space and what that could mean for uh, younger indigenous queer youth. Um, and so really my work centers on indigenous stories, indigenous centered stories and how to um, take up space with those. I actually wanna add something on that too about uh, uh, while we still have a few minutes left about uh, mentorship. And I do have a search for a mentor and it's hard to try to be a queer in looking for a mentor um, in in well in my in, in the field of filmmaking and journalism, I wanted to find someone. And you can find someone who's Inuk, or you can find someone who's queer, but try finding someone who's both and has time and is available. And I realized that the most important thing to me is peer mentorship and finding people in my lives that have different aspects that I want to emulate that are really important to me, and that's helped me the most. And I hope someday that I get to be a queer Inuk mentor. <laughs> someday, someday, if I'm so lucky. I'm sure you are. You know, I, I just, I know that folks look up to you, um, both of you. It's just, you guys are so um, thoughtful um, and impassioned. So, I mean, I do. You're, <laughs> I look up to you. <laughs> um, so we have just a couple of minutes until we uh, open it up for a Q&A session, I think for, for about 20 minutes. Um, but I wanted to kind of uh, end, I guess, uh, on, a, on a high note. And I, I learned this from, so I interviewed Jenny for my podcast many moons ago. <laughs> and uh, we, we remembered, it was like we finished and wrapped up our podcast interview and everything. And we were like, man, 
that was really hard. Like that was like really serious. You know, the things that we were talking about were so serious that uh, we forgot to like breathe and have fun and like remember the fun parts about, um, you know, certain conversations. So I wanted to ask you both, what is your favorite part about, uh, see, I'm learning, Jenny. <laughs> what is your favorite part about being queer and in you? I would say it's a combination of my my blood family, my community, and my chosen family. Like, I already have, I come from a giant family already, and I love my family. And then I have my my family here in the city that's my chosen family, and they're all a bunch of other peers. And I get both. I get, like, so much family and so much love and so much support from all sides. And, oh, and there is one other thing, too, that I, I want to mention quickly, which is, um, one time somebody here in the city said to me, you're so lucky. You have a place that is your home that you are connected to because he grew up all over and traveling. And I have a place where I can say I am from there. And so was my father and his father and his father and, fo and back and back and back forever. So I have a place that will forever be my home no matter where I go. So I get to be a queer Inuk and I get to live in the city and I get to have my city life. And I will always, always, always have a home to go back to. So it's my favorite part. Thanks, Ozzy. Jenny? I would say for me, being a queer in the Black person means I come from a community I was born into, who I am in kinship with, and like Ozzy said, a chosen community of queer peoples. And I've learned so much about myself and my origins from Inupak elders, family and family friends, and knowing this history and our stories uh, makes me stronger. I have a, a strong foundation because of that. Um, being part of the queer community is something special too. It means having people who support you and look at your queerness as a gift. And I think that's very um, beautiful. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so I think we're going to open it up now to Allison, and she's got a couple of questions locked and loaded from our listeners. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been really such a pleasure listening to you guys talk. And uh, I think you should all become my mentor. I think that we should create some kind of group and we should just be best friends forever based on this conversation. <laughs> Um, so we got two great questions. Um, one of them from uh, Kabluziak, who actually was one of the curators to Inua for the new Kamiuk building. Um, I will just read it off here and whoever connects with it, you can just go ahead. Um, Kabluziak wrote, um, first of all, she wrote, thank you, um, but I'm not gonna try to pronounce that because I don't speak Inuktitut. Um, and then she said, this is so beautiful. Big hello to all three of you amazing people. I wanted to see if you folks could talk about gender essentialism within our communities. I've been thinking a lot about Tunit and gender binaries lately. Much love, Kabluziak. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Allison. I just wanted to uh, point out that uh, Kabluziak goes by they, them. So just... Great. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for the correction and apologies, Kabluziak. I think we're just going to say the same thing. This one's tough. Uh, Ozzy, if you want to take a stab at it. So there's this weird, like, yes, gender essentialism is a big thing when people are very much like, this is what men do, and this is what women do, and this is this, and this is that. But I've been thinking about, um, to what Heather Campbell said uh, when we first started talking about this, about if you look at what people wear in our communities, men and women basically wear the same thing. Most people just wear, like, you know, short, manageable hair. That, that's easy to put a hat on when you're out on boat and usually t-shirts and clothes and whatever's comfy. And when you go out and you're wearing like, like parkas and it's winter time, you can't tell who's who. So in some ways, people are very, very, very insistent on strict gender lines and what men should do, what women should do, what's the role of men, what's the role of women. But then when you actually get down to the day to day, it's, um, it's, the, it's not quite as defined. I think there's a lot more freedom for uh, people who are identified as women to be more masculine. There's not a lot of room for uh, men who are more feminine to be more feminine in a lot of communities. And that's sort of where the issue is. That said, I think that things are changing and that as long as you are able to show that you're a good person and that you are connected to the, your community, to your family, I think that they people will get over it. I think that um, my, my, my solution has always been when someone has made a comment about 
me not being manly enough or whatever is to tease the person and to make fun of them because that's the thing that we all do and it breaks the tension and if anyone has ever spent any time around Inuit, what do we do we tease everybody and that's how we kind of break the awkward moment so I think that in some ways it's very strict other ways it's very relaxed and I don't think it makes any sense so just be prepared for me to tease you if you ever accuse me of not being manly enough because I don't really care um but that said in the communities yeah there's a lot of work that can be done I don't know what, what the answers are but I would love to participate in whatever it is that can help I've been kind of thinking about this question as well over the years, and I think it's a really, it's a really tough one because I've been connecting with elders, and I also acknowledge that they're also going through their own healing process, and so I'm being, I'm very aware when I talk about certain things with um, our elders because I don't want to bring up um, any trauma that they are working through or haven't started to work through. Um, but I've been thinking about like uh, how our generation we're, we're like not querying our communities, but we kind of are, um, or at least making space for these conversations to happen, which I think is where it will start is just talking about it, but it could be tricky. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about is, um, you know, these gender binaries, thinking about um, per pervasive gender binaries that have been imposed on our communities by, um, you know, the, the U.S. empire in the, U in, in the U.S. Um, and even um, in Canada. Um, but thinking about, like, who are some of our strongest community members? A lot of those are, like, our femmes or women. And um, thinking about, like, who... So I went back to, well, I went to Kinnegan to Wales, the community where my family's from. Um, and I, I learned a lot through that visit from some of the elders. And I also learned that one of the last whaling captains in our community was a woman. And so thinking about these like strict, sometimes strict uh, roles or binaries, um, we're, we're already breaking them in certain ways. Um, and, I, I think that the conversation just still needs to happen. Um, and I'm, I'm still working through this question as well in, in my own work and my own like practice and relations with uh, elders back home. But I think the gender binaries are, um, those are dangerous. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I think it's one of those things that um, these conversations will keep that going to, you know, it's not going to be solved overnight. So it's really great to talk about and to think about. Um, next, I have a question from Paige Krebs. They have asked, were there any queer elders or knowledge keepers that share teachings with you, paved the way for you? Thank you for this great discussion. So I always tell people at Labrador, <laughs> Labrador is full of lesbians I just I just grew up my, my sister's a lesbian as well I grew up around her friends so I mean it's kind of like bias but I also know people in my community who's like well not just let but not just lesbians some a lot of folks are probably bisexual as well they've never really gone through exactly how they identify but so many um there's been so many generations I've seen of like women in relationships with women raising families at different ages you know it could be grandparents could be mothers could be teenagers and there's still like there's still homophobia and everything don't like it's not perfect where i don't come from some sort of queer utopia i wish but we don't um and that but just there's just an acceptance of lesbians and there's still and i kind of grew up with this and when i married my husband my late stepdad uh louis he said he said to my best friend my best man oh i've seen a lot of women get together over the years but my first time seeing two men and um yeah it's just sort of like i knew i don't know like they never really gave me any particular knowledge i don't think they just think that they just were they were part of the town <laughs> And they just saw me as part of the town and they probably recognized some queerness in me. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, and they, they liked me. And I was, I don't know. I don't think that they gave me any particular teachings other than just to like, you can be yourself and you can fit in and you're part of here because this is what we're doing. And I think that just sort of came up, came out like rubbed off on me. Cause I think that even though I know that I'm different, 
than most of the other folks in my town. I know that that's where I belong. That's where I'm from. So it's, I think that their example wasn't really important to me. And yeah, I think that's more of what it was in a particular, particular teaching. For me, I don't think there was necessarily anyone that I found in my community um, at the time when I was coming out, when I felt like that support was extremely needed, like thinking about elders, but there was a lot of people around my age who are a bit older that I reached out to, that I connected to. Um, but I read a lot of uh, either scholarship or work written by other indigenous queer elders. Um, there's this really great one called A Two-Spirit Journey, the auto biography of a lesbian Ojibwa Cree elder um, by Mane, and I won't um, say their last name because I don't know how to say it. Um, and I know this is being recorded, so I don't want to be recorded saying it wrong. Uh, but uh, so I, I definitely um, found uh, people outside of my community, other indigenous uh, folks and elders through their, through their written works that really helped me. Um, and I think that we're able to, like for me, hopefully I get to grow into be a queer uh, elder that I can uh, support younger uh, indigenous queer folks. Um, but I think that our generation, um, you know, we're living in a totally different world. So it's, it's not easier for us to be out, but there are different um, walls that have been broken down um, um, because everyone's coming out story is different. And um, I think I, ha I honestly have a lot of privilege just being out. Um, and some people don't have the privilege to be out and to remain safe. So um, yeah, I found a lot of uh, inspiration in, in reading works by other indigenous queer elders. Yeah, that's a great point of um, even just what we're introduced to like in literature or online or pop culture in general is a can sometimes like help raise you in a weird way. Um, we have another question. Um, this was from the chat, but it's a great question. So I wanted to bring it forward. Thanks everyone. As a new Inuk in the prairies, I find Inuk erasure very intense. How do you keep your Inukness in your work when surrounded by mostly other indigenous folks or non-indigenous folks? Nakumik. I can answer that. I think pretty quickly is my work features uh, queer indigenous folks, queer Inupak folks. And um, it also, sometimes I use myself as a, as a um, participant in my work. So I think just um, focusing on indigenous centered stories um, really helps. Um, and knowing that so I've ran into, I've learned a lot over the past because um, if any of you have gone through an MFA program, you know you talk hours and hours about your work and have to explain every detail of why you chose certain elements or uh, so such and such, which I'm, I'm really enjoying. Um, but I've learned throughout my time in graduate school that, um, and from my mentors here, that I don't have to explain everything and my work doesn't always have to, um, it, I don't have to educate everyone on everything. They can find certain entry points through my work. And if they wanna do the work to know more, they can do that, but it's not up to me to always um, provide that information. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find that question again because I feel like I went on a tangent there. <laughs> No worries. Yeah. So just about keeping your inukness while surrounded by non inuit Okay. Yeah. I think it's just staying connected to who you are and your history and your family. And uh, if you can go home when you can. Ozzy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think I've, I've, I've worked in a number of indigenous organizations over the years um, where I would be like the only Inuk or the only person yeah but the only you know <laughs> and I would often have to like say to people oh that's really great thank you for teaching me about that we don't do that this is what we do and I try to just 
you know, I'll start friendly rivalries about what's better, caribou or moose, you know, like with the First Nations people. Little things just remind them like, hey, yes, you know, indigenous, but different. And I've even had some people one time, I remember this one time I explained to a guy like, yeah, yeah, we're Inuit, we're not First Nations. And he's like, oh, but you're, you're indigenous, right? And like, yes, yes, we are. We have your back. Don't worry. But we're not, we're different. He's like, it's because of the government, isn't it? And it's like, no, no, it's not. So I think that there's just a lot of room for conversations and these conversations, and what I agree with Jenny completely, that it's not your responsibility to educate everybody. So when you have the room and the energy and the capacity at the time to talk about this stuff, talk about it, bring it up talk about your differences your similarities correct people and when you don't ask yourself is it worth the energy putting into it right now to correct all this was it a slip of the tongue or do they not know can i have a quick conversation to nip this in the bud or do i just let it go and it's it's that's exhausting it's mental math that you do when you're trying to consider your time and your energy but i find what helps with a lot of other indigenous folks it, when this comes up and you're the only one and people say things that don't apply to you it's just like hey guys you know like you 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 know exactly this position that i'm in when you're anywhere other than these indigenous spaces it's like that to a, a lesser degree here and just be aware of that and then as soon as people realize that they just like oh yes i i understand now and it kind of gives them something to to go from so that's that's just personally what i do and people want to help people aren't jerks it's just it's just a lot of energy sometimes so yeah pick your battles Great advice. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if that's okay with you guys. Um, we just got one in, it says, I'm wondering, I'm familiar with the term two-spirit and how in specific First Nations they have or would have had their own terms. Um, in the Inuk culture, is there also something similar or parallel to uh, third genders, uh, non-binary? Um, I know that in our previous conversations, we kind of talked about this, so I'd love, love to hear you guys' thoughts. I could take a take that on real quick, um, and then pass it to Ozzy. That works with you, Ozzy. I have been thinking about this a lot, and I had been I I mentioned this earlier that I had been really searching for a, a new back term to describe you know what we kind of what we know as queer, um, and so again connecting with community members, and I was giving this. Um, this LGBTQ um, workshop to different folks who have host homes in Northwest Alaska. And after the presentation, an elder came up to me and um, first she said, hey, we're related. And I was like, okay, awesome. And we gave each other big hugs. Uh, and, and then she went on to tell me more about um, how there was a term within our dialect um, for, kind of, for someone like me. And she had mentioned how this term hadn't been used and it became kind of derogatory within the years. And so I started to think within the past couple of years, why am I so focused on this of, of the past um, of trying to find this, this, this term when we can create new terminology that fits us now? Because as Inuit, we're constantly um, integrating new technologies, transforming, um, creating different spaces for us to exist. And um, I know certain terms, uh, for example, Inupak elders came together a couple of years ago and um, created a new term for, um, for Diné, for Athabascan people. And so I know that there's, there's opportunity there for us in our own communities to um, create terms for us and by us within our languages. Um, I see in the chat that someone said, I, I love the term indigiqueer. Um, yeah, indigiqueer is great. And I think it's, it's um, there's a lot of opportunity for us to create our terminology. And we kind of, I, yeah, I'll, I'll pass it to Ozzy now. I could go on another tangent, but I won't. Um, yeah, I, well, I just want to say at a point in my life, I tried on the term two spirit. I was like, okay, yeah, let, 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 let's give this a spin. Is this a, represent me? I like that it's an indigenous, uh, uh, sexual, not sexuality, but indigenous, not straightness. <laughs> and it just, it didn't feel right. And it just didn't stick. And I know lots of wonderful, amazing two spirit people and it works for them and it's their term. 
but as an Inuk, I don't feel it fits me. It's, it's really, it really feels like it's a First Nations thing and it's, it's a wonderful term, but it's just, it's not mine. Um, then I discovered Indigiqueer and I really like it a lot. I think it's a great term to connect queer folk, queer Indigenous folk the world over. You know, queer folk in, you know, in the South Pacific, queer folk up North, down South, all the Indigenous queer folk. I love that there's an umbrella term that we can all collectively refer to ourselves with and connect with and learn about each other with. Um, but then when it comes down to another hood, yeah, I, it's like Jenny, I, we, we, I don't know what the term is. I don't even really, I know who to ask, but I don't know if, I, if the answer will be something I want to hear. It could be great, but we know what our language is like. It's very, um, not to talk, it's just so descriptive. And I don't know, I don't know. I, but I love this idea of trying to create a new term. And I think that right now what's going on in Canada is the ITK, which represents the Inuit um, on the national level is looking to standardize the language. And there's all these different initiatives going on right now for to come up with, um, yeah, standardized language for a bunch of modern terms. I think a lot of it has to do with technology and stuff like that, but there's also a really, this is a great opportunity right there to kind of work on this term together and get maybe, and if you look up about like the history about like how Two-Spirit was formed, it was formed from an indigenous conference happening in Winnipeg. There's nothing stopping a bunch of queer Inuit to get together and talk with a bunch of language holders and knowledge holders, even over Zoom and just try to like workshop a term that we like, that we feel fits us, that we are happy to pass on to the next generation. So um, I just think that sounds amazing. And if anybody ever wants to do this, I am all in. <laughs> <laughs> all hands in amazing um so we just got to time um and sadly that means i won't get to see your beautiful faces anymore so i'm so sorry <laughs> to myself <laughs> um so we're just gonna wrap up thank you so much to our wonderful speakers ozzy jenny and alice for moderating you guys are incredible and I'm so excited to see what the next the rest of the year brings for you guys um, and again want to acknowledge and thank our amazing advisory so Anya Keller Combs, Casey Purick, Komigu Hobson of the First Alaskans Institute, Krista Uliuk Zawatsky and Takrilik Partridge of the Nordic Lab at Saw Gallery. Uh, thank you to the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center and of course Inuit Art Foundation for hosting this event. And lastly, thank you to all of our attendees for joining and putting forward amazing questions for our panel. Um, and we want to remind you that the recording of today's webinar will be accessible on Smithsonian's Learning Lab, as well as the Inuit Art Foundation's website shortly. And that's it. I hope everyone has an amazing rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Queen Akbak. Thank you, Nakamik. <laughs>